VCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us on Crosstalk today here on the VCY American Network. Just before we get to our guest here today, I would like to mention that on yesterday's Crosstalk program, our guest, uh, Hussein Wario, had mentioned that uh, Wycliffe, the Wycliffe SIL linguist and missionologist, Dr. Richard Brown, that he had gone to Fuller Seminary. Uh, we need to correct that information that we learned he did not attend Fuller, rather that he pals around with scholars of Islam from Fuller. And while that issue was not the focus of the interview that was stated yesterday, and so wanted to make that correction here today. Well, uh, we're going to uh, focus on an important issue, especially in this year of 2012, namely it is that of voter fraud. Here to discuss the issue with us is Robert Knight. He's a senior fellow for the American Civil Rights Union. He's been a journalist for some 15 years, including seven as editor and writer of the Los Angeles Times. Uh, He's held senior positions with the Heritage Foundation, Family Research Council, Concerned Women for America, Media Research Center, and Coral Ridge Ministries. Uh, He has authored three books and hundreds of reports, papers, and articles. Uh, Many of his current columns are now appearing in the Washington Times. And uh, Bob, so nice to have you with us today on Crosstalk. Hey, Jim, I'm, pl- I'm really pleased to be on Crosstalk. I know you have a very informed audience. I can tell by the questions we get. Well, uh, thanks to guests like you. <laughs> Let's say, Bob, we are in the throes, as you know, of an election year. You just wrote about this. Uh, it's already proven to be a very contentious year on a national basis. We are seeing it very much so here in the state of Wisconsin with our current uh, governor uh, facing a recall. But uh, no doubt this contention is only going to grow in our nation as November draws closer to us. Uh, So often we hear this phrase, every vote must count. For some that means one person, one vote, but for others it takes on a whole new meaning. You wrote about this, about a a Pew study that calls into question our our voter voter roles. Uh, Tell us about that that Pew study, what it revealed. Well, they looked at uh, voter rolls in all 50 states, and they found out that, that, among other things, 1.8 million dead people are registered to vote. Uh, And... That that should be a wake up call uh, to a lot of people who say, "Well, voter fraud isn't really an issue. There's not a whole lot of evidence of it." Uh, they also found that uh, 2.68 million people are registered to vote in at least two states. 68,000 are registered in three states, and 1,800 are registered in four or more states. And we've had incidents uh, around the nation. Uh, the, the most famous being the the vote voter fraud that was attempted in Palm Beach County in 2000. Uh, when all sorts of Republican ballots were punched also for Al Gore, therefore invalidating them. Uh, and then, you know, until that was straightened out, the whole nation was in knots. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I media study later revealed that Bush did indeed win that election uh, and that there had been uh, tampering with the with the ballots in several precincts there. Uh, but I'm, you know, I, I'm worried about this upcoming election because ACORN uh, uh, is a left-wing group uh, that was heavily funded by taxpayers, among others. And, uh, they were in, uh, had convictions in multiple states for voter fraud, uh, registering people like Mickey Mouse uh, and Donald Duck. And uh, they, they have transmogrified into new names in different states, so they're well, still quite active. You know, Bob, I, I thought that we had kind of put to rest ACORN. I mean, we're led to believe that ACORN is no longer an issue. Uh, I've, of course, we're concerned about the phony voter registrations, the non-verifiable addresses, uh, fictitious names, fictitious people. Uh, but what you're saying, this matter is not over and done with? Uh, no. In fact, I have a book right in front of me called Subversion, Inc., how Obama's acorn red shirts are still terrorizing and ripping off American taxpayers. And this is by Matthew Vadim. Uh, I know Matthew. He works at the Capital Research Center, and he does good work. And he has laid out a case for how acorn operates and how they've turned into these other organizations that are still doing the same thing. So it's, it's scary, and, I, and people need to be very informed, because if someone votes illegally, they cancel out your vote. They steal your right to help determine our leaders, uh, the people spending our tax dollars. Uh, You might 
say that our most precious constitutional right is the right to vote because it undergirds all the other rights uh, we have in a free, self-governing nation. Uh, so this is very serious stuff, and we can't afford to sit back and, and hope the process plays itself out. People have got to get involved. You mentioned 1.8 million dead people registered to vote. What is normal process in taking somebody who's deceased off the voter rolls? Or is there not well, a process? Well, there used to be uh, strict processes in many states, uh, but what happened was the motor voter law in 1993 uh, actually made it more difficult for states to remove dead voters. Um, uh, there are several steps they have to go through, and often if they're not informed, these people stay on the rolls. Case in point is South Carolina, uh, where an election board study indicated that 200,000 people in South Carolina uh, lacked photo IDs, uh, but were registered to vote. And this was uh, about the controversy over their new photo ID law, which uh, the Justice Department just uh, put a stop to for no good reason. Anyway, the uh, the governor said, well, let's look into this. Motor, Motor Vehicle Bureau uh, handles uh, photo IDs, so have them study this. And they looked at it, and they found out that of the 200,000 people, um, 33,000 of them were dead. Uh, more than 90,000 had moved to other states and had already re-registered to vote in those other states. Uh, several more thousand uh, were registered uh, under different names, but almost the same name, like a William James would be registered somewhere else as Bill James, and it's the same guy. So it came down to less than 30,000 people who uh, were registered to vote and did not have a photo ID. And there was a slightly higher percentage of minorities uh, who fell into that category, but it was it was minuscule. And so you see uh, the left leaders around the nation saying, oh, these states that are moving to adopt photo ID are trying to suppress the minority vote. Mm-hmm. Uh, they even claim that one quarter of all African Americans uh, or minorities uh, lack a photo ID. Now, think about that for a minute. That means they can't drive, they can't take an air flight, they can't buy beer because they don't have an ID. Uh, they, you know, how do they function? I, I don't well, buy that at all. You know, I think it, Bob, and, and we are living a society, I mean, we go to our local library, and if I want to get uh, a Curious George and the Man with the Yellow Hat book, I have to show photo ID uh, to get that. If if I want to get rid of my waste motor oil, I have to show photo ID at the city's dump yard in order to be able to get rid of it. If I need a, a, a Sudafed or something like that from, from uh, the... the pharmacy, I have to show photo ID so I can purchase it from the pharmacist. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that that we're suppressing vote by not having photo ID when we have it put to use. Uh, we have those that uh, who even are seeking out shelter in some of the rescue missions across the country that have to show photo ID to get in. Yeah, yeah. And then you have Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who is the National uh, Committee Chairwoman for the Democratic Party, saying, quote, now you have Republicans who want to literally drag us all the way back to Jim Crow laws. Uh, d- explain that uh, for us, if you would. What are the Jim Crow laws? Because people hear that, but people sometimes don't remember what are the Jim Crow laws. That's a good question. The Jim Crow laws uh, uh, were enacted uh, in many states, mostly in the South, after the Civil War and after Reconstruction, and they made it difficult for African Americans to vote. Uh, they would uh, make the requirements so stiff that it would it would keep people away from the polls. They, they enacted poll taxes, so you had to spend money to vote, and some of them couldn't afford it. They'd have uh, literacy tests, um, uh, some residency tests that were absurd, um, and they were literally designed to discourage minority voting. Um, those have all been swept off the books. The process is straightforward and has been for years. Uh, to suggest that showing a photo ID like everybody else is supposed to show is, is a way to suppress the minority vote, to me, is a rather racist thing to say, because it implies that these people are just incapable of operating by the same rules everybody else is. Yet the table is often... soft liberal racism hmm. that, that pops up over and over, where they say, well, they're just... They're just you know they're they're handicapped in a way that uh, they they can't uh, we need to help them 
So why should they prove who they are like you have to? Yet, Bob, the tables are often turned in that they're saying that those in favor of photo ID are often declared to be racist. And on this yeah. issue, I understand that it was uh, Benjamin Chavis, the uh, former NAACP executive director, uh, accused yeah. those promoting a state photo ID law of trying to lynch democracy. I mean, isn't this carrying rhetoric too far? Yeah, I think so. And I, I just remember after Gabriel Giffords got shot in Arizona and how President Obama and other leaders were saying, oh, you know, we have to tone down the public rhetoric. And they were trying to blame the Tea Party somehow for this left-wing shooter. Uh, and then you have people like Ben Chavez talking about lynching democracy. That that's Those are fighting words. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that is designed to inflame, incite uh, he ought to be ashamed of himself, and he, and he knows it's not true. That, uh, this is worth bringing up. In Indiana, which has a good photo ID law, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld it in 2008. They couldn't find a single plaintiff who could plausibly prove that he or she was denied a photo ID or was incapable of getting one. Uh, every every plaintiff they brought up uh, in depositions admitted cheerfully that they'd have no trouble getting a photo ID, <laughs> so their case wow. fell apart. Uh, same with Georgia. Uh, that all went up through the appellate courts, and a liberal appellate federal judge appointed by Jimmy Carter said, I can find no evidence that this suppresses the minority vote. Uh, you can't even come up with one plaintiff there in Georgia. Uh, I, I guess one of the plaintiffs, though, was somebody who actually worked for DMV? Yeah, somebody actually worked <laughs> for DMV. And then my favorite was the 72-year-old woman who, in Indiana, tried to use a Florida driver's license and was legally registered to vote in Florida and tried to vote in Indiana. And they presented her as a poor Indiana person who was unable to get a photo ID to vote. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Wow. She's registered in Florida. She's trying to vote in Indiana, and you're putting her forward as a victim? Uh, it's laughable. I mean, it's, uh, they have no case. Surveys show more than 80% of Americans favor photo ID laws because they, they want their vote to count. They don't want it stolen by illegal votes being counted. So courts have said they have not found that evidence to suppress a vote. Uh, none. Not even a little bit. That, that's why when you see the, these these uh, liberal leaders uh, screaming from the rooftops that this is designed to suppress the minority vote, uh, they have no evidence, and, and they should be ashamed of themselves. Eric Holder did it in a speech in Texas a couple months ago. Uh, and and was an, when he was talking about South Carolina and how they came down on them with both feet, uh, South Carolina's law was halted under the Voting Rights Act. Voting Rights Act was passed a year after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and it applied to nine states, uh, that most of them in the old Confederacy, that did have Jim Crow laws at one time and were given special scrutiny by the federal government. Uh, under that act, if you try to change your voting law or requirements or redistricting of any kind, it has to be reviewed and okayed by the Justice Department or a three-judge panel of the District Court of Columbia, or a court in the District of Columbia. Um, I think that's anachronistic at this point. Uh, the laws are solid. Um, you know, it was it was probably necessary at the time uh, when they still had Jim Crow laws on the books, but they've been gone for years. All the states ought to be treated the same. Robert Knight is our guest here today on Crosstalk. He is Senior Fellow for the American Civil Rights Union. Uh, We're going to take a quick 60-second break and uh, come back with some more discussions here as it relates to voter fraud and uh, this matter of showing ID at the polls. And we've got a number of other related issues to this as well. You're listening to Crosstalk on the VCY American Network. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris, scientist with the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, just how much supernatural activity took place at the time of the curse? Chris, this was a very supernatural event. Before the curse, all of creation was very good, and there was no death. There was no carnivorous activity. All the animals were vegetarian. Things would have lived forever had not Adam and Eve rebelled against God's authority. Rebellion is sin, and the wages of sin is death. The curse on all of creation was pronounced at that point. Everything is now in this death spiral. I suspect that God genetically modified some of the plants and animals to give them thorns and thistles or crawl on their belly or whatever. Yes, indeed, the curse of Genesis 3 was a supernatural event. 
It has no parallel in the modern world, but yet its effects dominate the world. And that's the Back to Genesis truth. For more information, you can find us on the web at www.icr.org. You're listening to Crosstalk here on the VCY American Network. Robert Knight is our guest, senior fellow for the American Civil Rights Union, and our topic today is that of voter fraud. Uh, just before we continue on, uh, Robert, uh, if you would just uh, share a word about the American Civil Rights Union. Uh, you've got a website there as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to. If you go to theacru.org, that's T H E A C R U.org. Uh, you'll find uh, all the articles I've written. I, I'm a weekly columnist for the Washington Times, and I write for Town Hall and other places. And we also have uh, people from our policy board with columns like Walter Williams, the economist, uh, and we have attorneys. Uh, the ACRU is the antidote to the ACLU, in a nutshell. Uh, it was founded about 16 years ago by Bob Carlson, who was Reagan's welfare czar and an Eagle Scout, who got tired of the Boy Scouts being pushed around by the ACLU, so he founded a constitutional rights group that defends real constitutional rights instead of the fake ones that the ACLU makes up every day. So we we have filed seven briefs challenging Obamacare. We just filed two more this month at the U.S. Supreme Court uh, because we think it's unconstitutional. Uh, and we're defending property rights, uh, Second Amendment rights, and all the First Amendment rights. So, folks, when you just differentiate between the two organizations, ACLU, L for left, and ACRU, R for right. <laughs> hey, you know, that's pretty handy. Jim. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we well, like to say Ed Meese is on our policy board, the former Attorney General of the U.S., and he he likes to joke that ACRU is not Japanese for ACLU. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Well, okay. <laughs> Bob, uh, for many years here in our state of Wisconsin, uh, legislators had attempted to pass voter ID. I should say Republican legislators because Democratic legislators had insisted uh, just some of the arguments you gave. This is going to suppress the vote of minorities. It's going to suppress the vote of the elderly. It's going to suppress the vote of the disabled. And and uh, yet Republican legislators now have passed it. Governor Scott Walker signed it into law, and uh, just 48 hours ago this past Tuesday, we had our first primary here in the state, first election, and, and uh, guess what? It, it went off without a hitch. Uh, my question is this, so why has this become such a partisan issue? I think because the Democrats are trying to rev up their base, and they're trying to make the Republicans out to be bad old racists who don't want them to participate in the public discourse and uh, the election. I, I really, they're stoking fear. I, I think it's unconscionable the uh, rhetoric that's going on now, uh, without any basis. You know, if they had a basis, okay, I don't mind heated rhetoric if it has a point. But when there's no evidence whatsoever that this is going to hold down minority participation, uh, for example, uh, in Indiana and Georgia, uh, both of whose election laws were upheld. Uh, Minority participation increased in the very next elections after that, uh, after the after the law was uh, put on the books. Hmm. So, if if anything, uh, it gives people more confidence in the integrity of the ballot box. Uh, the state of Rhode Island, uh, that led by Democratic legislators, uh, put a voter ID law on the books, and uh, one of the. Uh, Democrats there said, you know, I had opposed this for years, but I, I didn't realize that it really does guarantee us all a, a fair and free election. Yeah. So it benefits us all. Uh, many people think that the uh, League of Women Voters, uh, as being uh, partisan neutral, uh, you know, they just sponsor debates and, and so on. But is there any significance uh, to their involvement in several of the court cases that are fighting the voter ID laws? I mean, they're, they're one of those that are challenging Wisconsin's photo ID laws at this point. League of Women Voters is like many so-called mainstream organizations that have drifted uh, to the left over the years. And, you know, what began as a nonpartisan, straightforward group uh, quickly becomes part of the uh, liberal establishment. And the League of Women Voters is, is clearly in that league. So they, they would be siding with the, the, the left, which is opposing photo IDs. Uh, and you got to ask why the left is so vociferous in opposing vo voter ID. Um, and I think the answer is uh, some of them on the left 
uh, have been committing voter fraud. And But the real reason, I think, is to stir up the base. It's to create the politics of resentment uh, and divide American against American and, and say that, you know, you really have to stick with us. We'll protect you against this big, uh, oppressive Republican Party uh, or conservatives or Tea Party or whatever the, you know, the current ogre is. The Pew Foundation, uh, you looked at the study, uh, they also sought to highlight the fact that uh, the number of people not registered to vote uh, is the problem that people can't register to vote, or is it that they're choosing not to register and get involved? I mean, is it a problem that people are not registered? Uh, it's a problem, but uh, I think it's more of a problem for Christians in America, because uh, there's a high percentage of evangelical Christians in particular who have never bothered to register to vote. And if you look at last few elections... They love to uh, complain, though. <laughs> what? They'll love to complain, though, won't they? Well, they complain, but yeah. then they don't bother to do the few things it takes to register to vote. Uh, there was a group out there um, called um, championthevote.com, and uh, it's led by Bill Dallas, and he's a and it's uh, I've seen him speak at an event in Washington, and he says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to register five million new Christian voters, and we can turn this country upside down. And I'm I'm all for it. I think that it's a great thing for them to do. It's nonpartisan. But they do point out that there are many close uh, tallies in the last election and, and in 2010 that could have been swung either way by just a few thousand votes if Christians had, had bothered to vote what, their what values. A, what, what is that website again? That's uh, championthevote.com. Okay. Uh, Bob, there have been kind of another area here with voter fraud. Uh, There are many who are concerned by news media outlets that are releasing vote totals before the polls are actually closed. And I believe in one case, even a day before the election takes place, a media outlet gave the vote totals. And many have called into question the the reliability versus the, the tainting of the media in this regard. Any thoughts on that? Well, that, that's what happened in Florida and back in 2000. Uh, the vote, they, they called the state for Al Gore, uh, and the western precincts, uh, in Pen- you know, west of Pensacola hadn't come in yet. Uh, they're in a different time zone. So, uh, the people there, uh, may- apparently many people turned around and went home. They thought it was all over, so why vote? Um, and the problem is, uh, early voting, uh, uh, it, it goes beyond just on what happens on election day. Uh, when Motor Voter created uh, the, the loosening of all the election requirements, uh, it really has created a, a, a weird system in which uh, election day no longer means what it used to mean. A lot, in some states, it's all by uh, uh, mail-in ballots, and that, that opens the door for voter fraud. Mm-hmm. Uh, some states don't even require... Uh, really a, a substantial ID before you obtain an absentee ballot. And so you can just, just mail it in and claim who, who you claim to be. Um, this is why photo ID should be adopted by every state. And uh, they really ought to curb the early voting. And we ought to get back to being Americans who get together and make the effort on Election Day to vote. I don't, I don't think it's that unreasonable to ask people to somehow accommodate that one day every few years. Absolutely. Uh, and I guess the other concerning aspect with this, too, I mean, we see the uh, the change in the vote in the caucuses in Iowa. All of a sudden, we had a different declared winner. I understand, too, there's controversy in the state of Maine uh, as it relates to some of the caucuses that have been canceled and then whether or not their votes would count the following weekend, uh, which could change the outcome of, of who took the state of Maine. Um, are, are we destined to, to get more of this uh, medicine? <laughs> Well, I hope not. Uh, um, in last year, all but 13 states had some sort of voter law reform going in their legislatures. Uh, I think five more states uh, adopted photo ID. Uh, five more adopted it, but Democratic governors vetoed uh, those laws. Mm-hmm. Uh, but others um, reduced early voting. Florida, I think, was one of them. Texas also. Uh, which is a, a step toward getting back a hold of the process where uh, the integrity of the ballot box is assured. They just have to keep doing that. And, uh, the, you know, some people have to have absentee ballots, and there are people who are elderly or otherwise confined. It's difficult for them to get to the polls, and, mm-hmm. you know, you have to make accommodations. But that's easy. Uh, but what what you don't do is make it so easy that voter fraud is, is easy, too. 
Yeah. And and this is another area, Bob, and it gets a little bit more technical, and that is about, uh, you know, reports that have come forth about the voting tabulation methods. Uh, uh, some alleging uh, programmers can easily change voting outcomes by those who use the electronic voting machines, and even those uh, machines that tabulate the paper ballots. Uh, any concerns in this regard? Well, yeah. Uh, the Going back to that 2000 election, uh, which the, held up the nation for weeks, uh, it really came down to Palm Beach County, Florida, uh, where a bunch of late-breaking precincts came in for Al Gore. And it turned out uh, the, the reason Gore prevailed initially before the recount was that many Republican ballots were said to be spoiled because both Al Gore and George Bush uh, were punched on the ballot. Then if you looked at the ballots... Uh, uh, they tended to be with all Republican candidates punched. So this is this is the easiest way to commit voter fraud. Uh, it's it's easier than trying to get fake ballots and get fake people to vote. You, all you have to do is invalidate votes from your opponent, and and you just just punch an extra punch and then do it. Remember the hanging chad? Oh yeah. All that. Yeah, well, it, it's suspicious when somebody's voted a straight-line Republican vote from president down to the dog catcher, and then, oh, they also voted for Al Gore. You know, that, that just didn't wash. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the recount uh, proved that uh, the, the result was that Bush had actually won. But, uh, you know, these, I mentioned in this column, voter fraud in this life and the next, uh, that in Nevada, in this past election, uh, well, in 2010, uh, Harry Reid in Clark County prevailed, and Sharon Angle was his opponent, and she was leading in the polls right up before the election, and it, it, it sl- she slipped a little bit, but it was still very close, but he beat her soundly. Uh, but in Clark County, some voters who were doing early voting, that is, going to their voting pre- uh voting booth uh, uh, and calling up an electronic ballot reported that Harry Reid's name had already been checked off on those ballots hmm. before they even had a chance to vote. Wow. And guess who was maintaining the voting machine? Yeah. It was yeah. the SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, which is a hard left uh, union uh, that was run by Andy Stern, uh, who was, I think, made more visits to the White House than than any other friend of Obama's, at least for a while. Bob, what, uh, what, what is your greatest concern for the upcoming November election? Uh, my greatest concern is actually the media. I, I, they, in fact, I'm, I'm finishing up a column right now for the Washington Times on, on how the media lie to people uh, by creating impressions. Um, and I, I'm hoping people will see through the media uh, and that candidates will be able to speak over the heads of the media uh, because the media are so hardcore leftists now, and I say that having a media background and working at the L.A. Times and Miami Herald and several other newspapers, uh, that I saw the newsrooms change over the years uh, from being pretty liberal but fair. People considered themselves professional journalists, and they wanted to get both sides of a story. Yeah, they might slant it a little bit toward the liberal way, but they still got both sides. Now they don't. Uh, they, they'll just uh, print or broadcast whatever advances the left-wing agenda on any given topic. Hmm. And and it's horrifying. And uh, it's like a controlled press. And that's what worries me. Uh, look at the look at the flap over the contraceptive order mm-hmm. by the Health and Human Services mm-hmm. to the Catholic hospitals and others, faith-based operations. Robert, uh, well, we could talk about it when we get sure. back. Again. And, and at the same time, folks, let's open our phone lines. If you'd like to talk here about uh, voter fraud today, voter ID, our number 800-733-9829 to take your questions and comments. 800-733-9829. Our guest today, Robert Knight. We'll be back in just one minute here on Crosstalk. Many textbooks have revised our true history, such is often the case with George Washington, the first president of the United States. Now available as a special edition is the reprinting of a vintage 1842 original entitled Life of Washington. You'll be able to pull back the dark shrouds of secular revisionist history and meet the humble believer, godly leader, and devoted son who became a fledgling country's source of strength and inspiration. Constantly seeking to serve others and to place God first, George Washington was a revered and reverent man. This rare historic biography will help you discover the man behind the title, Father of Our Country. 
From letters and personal accounts comes a man who lived by and was led by a deep and abiding faith. This hardcover book, Life of Washington, is available for a donation of $20 by calling 1-800-729-9829. Simply ask for the book, The Life of Washington, when you call 1-800-729-9829. This is Crosstalk on VCY America. Our guest today is Robert Knight, and he is with the American Civil Rights Union, ACRU.org, the ACRU.org. And uh, Bob, just uh, before we get to the phone calls, you had just mentioned this whole contraceptive mandate uh, issue that we've been hearing about. Uh, uh, The break caught you right in the middle of your thoughts, so we'll have you pick it up there. Yeah, I was worried about how the media portrayed it and how they turned it into a argument about contraception and mm-hmm. what the Catholic Church thinks about it, instead of the real issue, which was religious liberty. It was the idea of the national government telling church-related facilities, you will do this, even though it violates your conscience. There is no wiggle room. You will do it. Uh, not in a free country, you don't do that. That should have been what was at issue, and instead they tried to make it seem as if, oh, it's the the Mossback Catholic Church that wants to ban contraceptives. Even though the Supreme Court took care of that years ago, uh, they made it out to, you know, like these bad old Republicans like Rick Santorum want to take your contraceptives away. You know, that, that, that was the narrative. And there was one other thing that really bothered me, and that was that... Uh, when they got caught doing it, and all 150 Catholic bishops stood firm, even the liberal ones who pushed Obamacare and said, this cannot stand, and we're going to read a letter to our parishes. Um, then President Obama, in a hastily arranged press conference on a Friday, suddenly said, well, you know, we we're going to give it a year to work things out, but uh, given that uh, it's become a political football, we're going, to, uh, we're going to back off and now make insurance companies pay for this instead. <laughs> yeah, like that's uh, the problem. Yeah, yeah, it still makes the Catholic facilities provide that insurance that violates their conscience, so it didn't really change anything. But he also told uh, what I'd say is a lie, uh, because he indicated that they'd been given a year to work out the details, and they did not. A senior White House official said, was asked by a reporter, so is this a year in which you work out things, or is it, you know, mandatory? And they said, yeah, they have a year to comply, that's it. Wow. So, you know, when they're caught, they misrepresent it, and then the media play along with it, and it's just <laughs> reprehensible. Just before we take that first call, the, the question, Bob, is what can people do? <laughs> you know, we, we oh, see yeah. this, we identify the problem. What, what's the course of action? Okay, the course of action with the media always is, you know, let them know how you feel and how you don't like being <laughs> lied to. Uh, you can... Um, you can contact your local media. You don't have to always go after the networks because sometimes the local papers are just as bad. Mm-hmm. And I've written letters to the editor of my local paper and reminded them of facts they left out and that sort of thing. That really editors really pay attention to that stuff. Um, and, but as far as voting fraud that we were talking about earlier, uh, people can become poll watchers very easily, and you don't have to do a whole lot. You just show up and you watch and make sure the same guy isn't coming back again and again. Mm-hmm. And that's really not that hard to do. And I think that with the gravity of this upcoming election, uh, people need to do that. They need to make sure they're registered to vote, that everybody they know of like-minded values is registered to vote. And they ought to think of ways of getting people to the polls who might have difficulty. You know, there's a lot of evidence that um, liberals are very good at this. They go into nursing homes and they get people to sign affidavits and and, and they get absentee ballots and they don't even know who they're voting for. Uh, I'm not suggesting conservatives do the same thing, but I'm saying that if you have people who are, you know, of sound mind, who know who they want to vote for, then help them out, get them to the polls. Let's go to the phone lines here. Uh, Kay in Pensacola, Florida, thank you for calling. You're on the air. Hi. Um, I just have a question. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and um, I live in Pensacola right now, but I'm moving back to Pens- uh, moving back to Memphis. And um, I was wanting to continue voting in Memphis, where I'm originally from. I'm still registered there, really, but um, I was wondering, what do I have to do to be voting in Memphis since Uh, I'm moving back there? Yeah, the first thing you should do is go online 
and uh, go to the Board of Elections in uh, Tennessee and find out what's required. It's probably very easy. Um, you can probably find out if you're still registered to vote there, and in which case you're all set. You don't have to do anything. If you voted in Florida, though, uh, then you will have to change your registration back to Tennessee. But, again, it shouldn't right. be that tough. Um, yeah, well, they, you know, they sent me a, a letter saying that my voting place in Memphis has changed, so I'm still registered there, but I voted here. But I just wonder, am I going to be in trouble if I go vote in Memphis, too? Oh, wow. Well, that's the, see, that's one of the problems. States don't compare notes. You know, they, they don't compare their voting rolls, so often people are registered to vote in two places. Perhaps this is where um, a phone call to the, to the State Elections Board would be in order. Yeah, why not State give election. a call um, and see what you should be doing. Thank you, Kay. Appreciate that. Uh, but yeah, especially, and that's part of the problem that came up in the last uh, presidential election too, with people voting twice for even same offices in different locations. Uh, uh, certainly, many instances of that. Uh, but well, uh, here's one that is worrisome, and that's college students. Uh, there was a, some reports that in some campuses, um, and I <laughs> might have been in Milwaukee, uh, University of Wisconsin, in Madison. Madison, yeah. Oh, Madison, not Milwaukee. Well, I'm sure uh, both. <laughs> well, you know where I'm going with yes. this. They they would sign the students up to vote uh, in the in the election there, and also give them absentee ballots for their home state yeah. if they're out of state students. So the students get to vote twice, which is just not right. Let's go to Rachel calling from Racine, Wisconsin. You're on the air, Rachel. Yes, I just want to comment on a question. I worked the polls, Racine, under a, a, a uh, it was an alderman. Um, who was coming in with his campaign manager, and I was next to another poll worker, a little old lady. She asked his campaign manager, are you a U.S. citizen? Um, because I think we were allowed to, to ask him that. Somehow she got around to that. And he actually said no. He wasn't a U.S. citizen. And that's the only way he didn't vote that time, because he was really ready to, to vote. Um, and, you know, the, the alderman said, well, why didn't you just take the oath? Why didn't you, you know, he's been living here for 34 years, and he just wasn't a citizen. He didn't take the oath. He's got property, whatever. But my question is, now, say they're not a citizen, and they go ahead and they get some type of phony ID. What's to prevent all that? You know, the, the, the driver's license and so forth. Um, from not being... Um, a, a real, legitimate person. I don't know how they go, even go about, about doing that. I'll just hang up and take, you, you know, your your answer off, off the air. Thank you, Rachel. Bob, what about the illegal factor going in, the illegal uh, aliens um, and, and their presence? Well, you're not going to catch everybody, for mm-hmm. sure. There are people who can obtain phony IDs and then, and then get to vote because of it. But I would think that's a very small number. Um, more often than not, Getting a, a genuine government-issued photo ID uh, is a bar to voter fraud in most cases. Not every single case, but most cases. Uh, most people will, will go through the, you know, whatever it takes to to have a legitimate identification. Um, it, it's it's like uh, theft at Walmart. You know, they they can put in measures, they can do everything they can, they can discourage a lot of it, but somebody's going to shoplift somewhere. Uh, so I, I wouldn't fret over that, but I would see photo ID laws as generally ensuring the integrity of the ballot box. You're far better off with a law in the books than you aren't. Cynthia, and if there isn't one. Cynthia, you're our next caller. Go ahead. You're on the air. Okay. Go ahead, Cynthia. Oh, hello. Yes, I, I, I'm an African American woman, and I had no problem voting. Hmm. I, you know, uh, but I also. Uh, sign my name. Now mm-hmm. that's that I never, you know, did before, and I've been voting ever since I turned eighteen. Cynthia, that is, yeah, that's something that went into law with the photo ID here in the state of Wisconsin to both show the ID then to sign the the actual register book, so that uh, that yeah. and, and that keeps somebody else from from occupying that same spot with that signature is there. It says this person now indeed has voted. Well, I think that's a good idea. I do too. Yeah, yeah. And uh but the only thing that that would that would hinder you is uh if you if you don't have a utility bill in your name. You know, because I I was living with my mother mm-hmm. until she passed away and um 
she uh, uh, it, everything was in her name. Right, and and Cynthia, laws have have changed. There is a number of things that one can take for proper identification for that initial time, and, or in getting that photo ID to begin with. But once you have the photo ID, that's all that's necessary. Appreciate your call uh, so much uh, from Wisconsin to Navarre, Florida. And Rick, you're on the air. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon, and good afternoon uh, to, to Mr. Knight. Great show, as usual. Um, Navarre, where I live, is um, up in northwest Florida, west of Tallahassee in the Panhandle. And earlier during the discussion, uh, uh, Mr. Knight had mentioned that uh, when the networks called the 2000 race for the Gore uh, team, that that had depressed the vote in northwest Florida. Well, it didn't depress it enough because uh, we gave uh, the bush Cheney team a solid majority out of northwest Florida, and a lot of people were were incensed that the networks had made the call, because what happened is since we're on Central Standard Time, they were making the call after the polls closed Eastern Time in Peninsular Florida and east of Tallahassee. So actually, I think it might have bumped the, uh, the number of people who went to the polls up. I don't know that for sure, but in any event, uh, uh, we gave them a solid majority, and that's why my Miami-Dade had to go stuff in ballot boxes to make up for the victory <laughs> we had given uh, Bush Cheney. <laughs> So I, I wanted to give ourselves a little pat on the back there. Uh, if the vote was depressed, it wasn't depressed enough. Uh, but clever tactic, nonetheless. Uh, it just didn't work in this case. Uh, and, and a quick question, if I may, for Mr. Knight. Would you be in favor of returning the paper ballots to a to leave, have a paper trail? Well, wouldn't that cut down the corruption and the, and the ballot box stuffing? Thank you, Rick. Yeah, I think it would, actually. It's a pain in the neck to have paper ballots compared to electronic, but it's so easy to manipulate voting machines now. You know, unless there's some cyber sleuth who, who can figure out a foolproof way to ensure the integrity of the vote, um, I'm when I'm given the choice, I vote in Virginia, and I just voted in a in a recent election, and I, I took the paper ballot. I just figure it's harder for them to mess with it than the electronic ballot. Hmm. Uh, as far as that that vote total in the Panhandle, um, well, I'm going by what uh, John Fund wrote in his excellent book, uh, Stealing Elections. And he says there is evidence that it did suppress some of the vote in the, in the panhandle. Mm-hmm. But as, as your, your caller said, maybe just not enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it didn't suppress it enough to overcome the fake stuff going on on the East Coast there. Thank you, Rick, for your call. Next to Port Huron, Michigan. Harry, you're on the air. Hey, guys, thank you very much. And, uh, Bob, here's a piece of audio you can play to anybody against that, the thing that it, it oppresses, this photo ID. I'm a blind man on a fixed income, Social Security, and uh, I didn't have to pay for my ID. So when they tell you it's not free, I don't know what they're thinking. Um, the second thing, though, I want to say is um, I think we need to, the, the 2012, or this is 2012, and I think that we need to allow people to vote over the phone. My bank, when I call my bank, I can do any kind of business that I need to do if I punch in my numbers uh, on the phone uh, with my bank. I can pay my bills. and uh, so Like with a PIN number or something like that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bob, what's your, what's your thought on that? Well, if you could guarantee security um, of the same level as, say, credit card companies require, you know, maybe that's a good idea. Um, my, the wheels are already turning, and I'm thinking about how to get around it, you know, it, <laughs> trying to have the criminal mind and, and think what it would take to commit voter fraud over the phone. Um, you know, that, that I would like to run that idea by some of the, the experts who, who study this issue time and again mm-hmm. and uh, say, what, what about voting over the phone with a secure pin? Okay. Thank you, Harry, for raising the question. We're going to take a quick 60-second break and uh, come back to uh, some more of your calls. Our number, 800-733-9829. 800-733-9829. And we're speaking today with Robert Knight. We'll be right back. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brandon House. Our website's worldviewweekend.com. As we look at Romans chapter 1, we're trying to understand, is God judging America? Has God removed his divine hand of protection and given us over, given us over to the things that our nation is pursuing, homosexuality, violence and debased culture, pagan spirituality, the worship of nature, corrupt leaders who practice immorality and encourage others to do the same? These are all the things we see in Romans 1. But Romans 1, verse 23 says that they also take the incorruptible God 
and they transform him into an image like corruptible man. Isn't that interesting? We have a man running for president, Mitt Romney, a Mormon, and Mormons have taken the incorruptible God. They've made him into an image like corruptible man. Mormons believe God was a man of flesh and bone who evolved to become God. I could go into several of the other people running for president, but this is just one example where maybe God is giving us leaders that fit with what we see in Romans, people who have transformed God into a corruptible man. You can check out the website of our guest, uh, theacru.org. That stands for American Civil Rights Union. We're speaking with Robert Knight, Senior Fellow for the American Civil Rights Union. And today our topic is that of voter fraud. We're going next to uh, Pace, Florida, and uh, a lot of Floridians here today. Bill, go ahead. You're on the air. Yeah, thank you uh, you, on your guest. Look, at I'm a a 20-year Navy veteran, but what made me mad about the last big election was, how many active duty overseas military ballots were not counted? Hmm. Oh, yeah, that's a a disgrace. Yes, sir. The very people (laughs) putting their lives on the line uh, can't even, you know, enjoy the franchise of voting that they're defending. Yeah, that happened. And the lame excuse was, we didn't get the ballots in time. They always throw up some type of roadblock, because I believe probably 80 to 90 percent of active duty military personnel probably vote Republican. Uh, I think they do. And possibly. I th- there's evidence that to this day, I, I think there are some military ballots that haven't been counted in Florida. Yeah, uh, that's why I'm calling Because they weren't delivered yeah. on time, so they said, oh, heck with it. You know? Yeah. And I think they would have gone heavily Republican. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what really gets me. And one other quite quick, uh, you said the 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 people uh, that are doing this voter fraud have no they have no shame they should be shamed but to me they don't have any shame uh, well they've got people at the highest levels of government defending it basically by saying you know by falsely accusing people who want photo id of being uh of wanting to suppress the minority vote it's just not true yeah, thank you for the call here. And, and matter of fact, we see the U.S. Justice Department, the U.S. Justice Department, getting involved in really states' rights issue on this issue. Yeah, they they intervened in South Carolina. They had no business shutting down their law. Uh, it's a perfectly good law. Uh, like uh, Georgia and other states that have the photo ID, uh, they provide free photo IDs uh, to people who cannot afford to get one. Mm-hmm. So there's no cost involved. And Governor Nikki Haley actually said, look, uh, I feel so strongly about making sure everybody who is uh, eligible to vote does is able to, that we'll drive you to get the photo ID and we'll drive you to the polls that day if you call us. Yeah. I mean, they're bending over backwards, and the Justice Department still came down on them with both feet, saying, oh, you're suppressing minorities uh, without evidence. Let's go to uh, another caller from Racine, Wisconsin. Candace, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, first and foremost, I would love to thank you for your ministry and bringing up this topic. I'm involved in the Verify the Recall. And if you want an eye-opening experience, take a look at the things that you see people are willing to do. And I know that at the heart of this is um, is the, the, the battle between good and evil. Um, I, you know, I think that if we're honest, we can say that that's what it is. Uh, just for reference, Candace, for those not familiar with this, our governor, Scott Walker, is subject to a recall vote right now. Verify the recall is is a group that's been formed to actually uh, be sure that these are valid signatures uh, that have been launched to uh, on the petition drives, make sure that they're not bogus, that there are actual people behind those, and that they meet the qualifications for it. Uh, yes, absolutely, mm-hmm. and it's just an absolute eye-opening experience to see what people are willing to do. Yeah. Um, one of my, two points quickly I wanted to make is, one, if we're willing to penalize people for um, voting, fraudulent voting in a voting booth, why are we not in the same realm willing to penalize people who are willing to put their name on a uh, that, you know, falsify their name on one of these um, recall ballots because it, it, it's just yeah. 
it's the same injustice. And point two I wanted to make that's something that's been very concerning and I haven't been able to get an answer about is um, we're looking at addresses that are, um, are, are inadequate in some way, you know, or there, there's a problem with someone. Mm-hmm. But if they get just addresses, say they get a hold of a Republican or conservative list of people and they put all of those names in, they're not going to be red flags because it's Don, Donald Duck or a bad name or a bad address. And yet if we, as conservatives, don't go in there and say, wait a minute, my name doesn't need to be on that list, how many thousands of people could be a part of this unknowingly? Yeah, and thank you for the call here. And, Bob, we've got a situation in this recall, of course, where people are finding their names on these petitions when they never signed them themselves. One person boasted to have having signed 80 times the recall petition, uh, and, and yet uh, that supposedly is counted in what they claim to be a million signatures against the governor. Uh, it's it just a, a, a lot of uh, what many people would deem to be fraudulent. Well, I hope it's igniting people's outrage in Wisconsin, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because you do have a courageous governor, and he saved uh, a lot of people from being laid off (laughs) and put the books in order and and stopped uh, taxes from going up and so forth. Uh, And the the left is gunning for him with everything they've got. And I, uh, you guys in, in Wisconsin are setting the tone for the whole nation on how to get our financial house back in order. Everybody's watching very carefully what's happening in Wisconsin. Uh, the, the national unions are, are involved. Uh, this is the most important election between now and November. Um, and so uh, I, I hope that what they're trying to do, if they're trying to commit voter fraud, uh, I hope it backfires. I, I hope it gets good people to turn out and say, well, that's it. I don't want my vote canceled, so I'm going to work hard to help out any way I can. Candace, thanks so much for your call. We're going to squeeze one last call in from ha- Happy Camp, California. Stan, you're on the air. Okay, thank you. I just have a quick question. I was wondering, we hear so much about voter fraud, but yet we never hear of anybody getting arrested or doing time. Mm-hmm. And I just wondered if you had an answer for that. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, there have been a number of convictions of ACORN uh, volunteers uh, who committed voter fraud, at least eight eight incidences where they actually were convicted in a court of law. So, you know, some people who are doing it on a, on, in the big time uh, have been hauled in and convicted. And I, I don't know whether they did jail time or they were fined or what. And in other cases, we're finding that these cases are just, you know, summarily dismissed as well, um, you know, on the individual level, and, and that's uh, kind of disheartening. Stand. Yeah, and as far as that, uh, the uh, signatures on the recall petitions, I think it would be hard to find out who signed it illegally when it's a, if it's a phony name to begin with. Yeah. Uh, but there must be a law in the book saying you can't do something fraudulent like that. Yeah, not fraudulent, but uh, you can sign multiple times. They're trying to change that law. Bob Knight has been our guest here today. Uh, quickly, again, your website? TheACRU.org. Great. Bob, thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, thanks for having me, Jim. And, folks, thanks for joining us here on Crosstalk. You've been listening to Crosstalk via satellite and the Internet from BCY America. Views expressed may or may not be those of this station. For a CD of today's program, send a donation of $6 or more to VCY Tape Ministry, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208. Or download by RSS or podcast from CrosstalkAmerica.com. And join us again for Cross.